All right, guys. Hey, it's, uh, it's the end of the season in um, World Racing League, and I figured I'd put together a overall season um, rundown of what happened this season, and we'll try to do this every every season going forward. I'm um, just here in the shop. It's a Sunday, so it's uh, relatively quiet, other than the dog is here staring at me, so he'll probably make a little bit of noise. Uh, as you can see, we've got 147 somewhat torn apart, and we'll kind of go into you know, what happened this season um, as far as uh, damages and things like that. Um, and you'll see I have some notes because uh, trying to track what all happened is going to be kind of difficult. And I'll try to interlace some uh, some video from the actual cars, from the actual events to kind of show what happened. Starting off, uh, we're obviously a GP1 car. Um, it's an E46, started life as a 330CI. Um, originally the intent was build it as a J prepared car for BMW CCA. That's back when uh, they allowed those classes at Thunder Hill. And the intent was to run the, the 25 hour and then convert it back to a Spec E46. Um, pretty much everything was Spec E46 compliant other than we had some upgraded suspension. We had a little aero and we had a JP tune on it, but it was still an M54 B30 car. And then we ran it as such. Eventually it kind of morphed into a, a Super Touring 4 car for NASA. Still with an M54, uh, we just left the arrow on it and things like that. And it did really well as a ST4 car. Um, in fact, it was faster than most ST3 cars. And then we started, hey, let's do some more endurance racing with it. We did some uh, AER, we did some WRL back when they were still mostly out west. We were classified as a GTO car and it really couldn't hang with GTO cars, not with an M54. Uh, putting out like maybe 220 to the wheels. So we made the decision probably two years ago to go all in with uh, World Racing League. It started doing really well. Uh, we won some races and it was competitive uh, in GP1. Starting last year was kind of our full on commitment to World Racing League. We really enjoyed it and we were really competitive with it, but we were kind of finding the limits on the hardware. Two eight hour races in a weekend, plus qualifying and everything else is, is hard on equipment. And so this season, 2022, was probably our first full effort into the season. We finished the season with a chance for the championship and I'll, I'll get into that, but uh, it was overall a good season. We kind of, you know, shored up a lot of the, the shortcomings on the chassis and components, um, and we learned a lot as well. So I'll just start with the first race of the season, which was NOLA. And uh, it, that was a very interesting race. We actually finished um, P1 both days, P1 on Sunday or Saturday and P1 on Sunday. And at the time I was still one of the, one of the drivers. Uh, on Saturday, I think I did the final stint and I was just fuel saving the entire time. You know, I can't put down the fastest laps uh, out of our driver group, but I can fuel save. And uh, I was fuel saving all the way to the end and we ended up winning on Saturday. Uh, turned around for Sunday, I think we were starting on pole again. Ended up winning the race on the back of a wrecker. <laughs> Interesting enough, the left rear hub uh, sheared off and we lost our left wheel. Jerry Kaufman was in the car and we had the big enough lead over P2 that the race ended with us on the back of a rollback and still taking P1. Um, we still got protested for fuel capacity, got pulled in uh, on the back of a, uh, of a rollback into the paddock, missing our left rear, passed the, the fuel protest, no problem there, and ended up winning both days uh, under really, really odd circumstances. I've never seen that happen before. We, in fact, at the time, we didn't even know what the rule was for, it, do, you, do you have to cross the finish line in order to win? And uh, I had to ask a, um, a uh, a uh, pit marshal. I was like, so what does this mean? Do we win or do we DNF? How, how does it work? And it turns out we won. That was pretty interesting. We finished P1 both days in class, P10 overall on Saturday and P14 overall on Sunday. So that was a pretty good result. We started out the season with a bang. And then we go into Barber and Barber is kind of my nemesis, my personal nemesis. My very first race as a driver, an amateur guy in BMW CCA and a Spec E46, I get taken out on the very first lap almost destroyed the car, uh, took me out of the race. And so that was my introduction into, uh, <laughs> into club racing. And so that, that was my introduction into Barber as well. So I haven't had good results at Barber. So we go back to Barber this year, 2022, and everything's looking good. And then early, and I think it was the first stint, our car and two GTO cars are going three wide, kind of on the back straight. And the GTO car in the middle, which is kind of off pace, I mean, he's getting over—he's getting overtaken by a GP1 car. 
and he kind of jukes right in the braking zone and tags us. Uh, Johan Schwartz is in the car, so a pro driver knows what he's doing. Tags us, we go spinning off into the grass, into the gravel. Uh, Johan's able to drive it back in, but we've broken a left rear uh, trailing arm. And so we're out on Saturday. Um, there's real no point in going, going back out. We fix it, prep for Sunday, and uh, get ready to go there. So on Sunday, our bad luck at Barber continues. Car starts missing, acting like it's starving for fuel, even though it's been refueled. We're still able to drive, but it's, it's missing really badly. Um, so the driver brings it into the pit road. I'm thinking uh, bad fuel pump. Um, our lift pumps are showing, I mean, we have the data, the, the lift pumps are showing that they're, they're providing fuel, um, but the engine fuel pressure sensor is, is showing some weird, weird numbers. So I'm thinking main fuel pump. So fortunately it's all in the trunk and accessible from the pit road. So he pulls in, pop the trunk, do as quick a possible fuel pump change as, as we can do, send him back out and he starts seeing the same symptoms. It's acting like it's fuel starving, even though it's got plenty of fuel in it. So bring him back into the pits. And uh, now I'm thinking fuel filter. Maybe we've got some bad gas. So pull the fuel filter, maybe another five minutes on the pits, send him back out. That's, that's, that was the fix. Um, but by this point, we're so far down. It's, uh, you know, we ended up, I think we ended up just calling it and it was a DNF for us again. That's what happened to us at Barber, two double DNFs. So didn't help our points for the season or anything like that. So we roll into mid Ohio and uh, mid Ohio is kind of one of those tracks that really suits us. Our car doesn't make lap time on the straights. Most of our time is made up under braking and in the corners. So a track like mid Ohio, that's relatively technical and doesn't have super long straights that are started with short cor or slow corners. So, so we did really well in mid Ohio. We came in P1 in class on Saturday, P8 overall, which is really good. Uh, and then on Sunday, we came in P1 again. Uh, we won by two laps and P10 overall. And so Mid-Ohio treated us well. And, and plus also the weather, it's kind of cold that time of year. The track's kind of damp and anyone that's driven Mid-Ohio knows that the, the track is treacherous. If it's just mildly moist out there, it's, it's, it's hardly any grip. So then we roll into Road America, a track that shouldn't suit us because of the really long straight uphill, uphill straight at that. And then you even have a back straight that's, that's kind of long. So it's kind of more power dependent. We finished P4 on Saturday, uh, should have won, but we had some penalties. Um, there was, there was a bad wreck. There was a red flag, a really long red flag. And, um, we had some radio communication issues with our driver. He didn't know exactly what was going on. Couldn't see a corner station. He ended up rolling when it was under red flag conditions. We we're yelling at him on the radio. Hey, stop, stop the car. Uh, he misunderstood and rolled, I don't know, like a hundred feet or something like that, uh, right near pit entry. So we got tagged with some, uh, some penalties there and that put us down. And so that's why we ended up, uh, finishing P4, uh, on Saturday, Sunday, we finished P1 by two laps, no, no penalties or anything like that. Finished P11 overall, but we did have some engine issues. We got called to the dyno after the race, as we do often, the car was just running really poorly. And I had heard from several other competitors that a lot of guys had possibly gotten bad gas there locally, somewhere Elkhart Lake, somewhere around the track, because uh, we're just running 93 pump gas. So we typically just go off the track to get our fuel. Car was missing. It was just doing all kinds of weird, funky stuff. Um, we, the only reason we won is because we built enough lead uh, before it started running poorly. We leave, we'll leave Road America with a P4 and a P1, which is was pretty decent. I think we're leading the points by now. We go into, DNA, or into Daytona. And Daytona, like Barbara, was just bad luck for us. I think we were on pole. Um, Daytona is another one of those tracks where we shouldn't um, excel just because the it's a power track with the, the Roval and everything. 30 minutes into the race, we were P2, P1, missed a shift. We got back in front of them. This is on the oval going into the bus stop. The car that was now P2, which was a big mission car, uh, starts walking back on us. We're still in the, we're still in the lead going into the bus stop. Um, they try to outbreak us, try to go into the bus stop side by side. It didn't work out. Um, they tag our left rear while we're loaded up, which spins the car um, into the infield. Rear of the car hits uh, the tire barriers, ends up shifting the whole rear of the car, shatters the rear glass, breaks the wing, uh, does all kinds of damage. It's it's possible it's repairable. You know, if it was a Saturday Sunday race, we probably would have probably would have done that and, and raced on Sunday. But it was a 14 hour race. And not knowing what other kind of damage it did to the car, uh, especially to the suspension, we, we decided to just pack it up and go home. The, the guys from Big Mission were very apologetic. I, I commend them on that. 
Uh, it could have been seen as a racing incident. It could have been seen as something else, but unfortunately it was very early in the race, first 30 minutes and, uh, we were out. So Daytona, we leave with, uh, was nothing. And we go into road Atlanta and road Atlanta is kind of one of our home tracks. Um, we're located in Lexington, South Carolina, about three hours from, from road Atlanta. So we're there all the time. Uh, I was there all the time when I was amateur racing with uh, NASA and BMW CCA. And, and so we're really familiar with the track, even though it's kind of a power track, it, it does have some technical sections um, uh, where our car can excel. And so we finished P1 on Saturday uh, by one lap and P5 overall. So really good uh, result there, uh, especially because Road Atlanta is kind of notoriously hard to pass. Uh, there's very few opportunities. Uh, passing in the S's on equal cars is difficult. Uh, you're really down to like 10A, 10B, um, maybe turn one, which is kind of sketchy, but there's not a whole lot of passing opportunities unless you're just passing really slow cars. Then on Sunday, we finished P6, and that was down to a mechanical failure. We were leading again, and uh, we were trying, uh, trying out kind of a prototype front suspension on the front suspension on the car that we're helping develop with another company. The pin that goes into the front subframe that holds the control arm, front control arm just sheared straight off. Happened right at 10B, going through 10B. There's a big gravel trap there, so the car just kind of skidded off in the gravel trap, um, not doing really any further damage. We got it pulled in full of probably 200 pounds of gravel and uh, got it jacked up, got the splitter off of it, uh, replaced the arm, probably the repair, probably maybe took 30 minutes. Well, the, the big holdup was waiting for the car to get towed back in, but we got it repaired. Uh, the splitter was so full of gravel and everything else that we just pulled the splitter, pulled the wing and sent him back out there and told him just turn laps, hold position. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you look at it, the, the race got called uh, due to rain and lightning. So we ended up finishing P6. So we got a few points, um, but not P1 like we were hoping for. Took the car back to the shop and went back to the drawing board on that front suspension and totally totally beefed it up. Um, I mean, it is as bulletproof as possible now. So I, I have a whole lot of confidence in it now and it, it hasn't shown any issues since. So the race after Road Atlanta was High Plains, which uh, we decided to skip um, for a few reasons. One, we really needed to look over the car and fix all the issues that you know we'd seen. Two, High Plains is a really long tow away, all the way out in Colorado. And so we would spend at least a week on the road um, and then that's just time we're losing for prepping for the next race. And we had a pretty, pretty safe, uh, points lead by that point. So we were just kind of like, ah, let's just focus on the next race. We prepped instead for uh, VIR. So VIR is another one of those tracks we're very familiar with. It's about four hours from the shop. We run it all the time. I've ran it all the time as, uh, in sprint racing and everything else. We really like VIR. Uh, so Saturday we finished P1. We won it, uh, won it by three laps. Uh, we're P11 overall. Again, that's really great results considering VIR is a bit of a power track. You have long straights, not so much slow corners leading to them. Um, I mean, Oak Tree is kind of slow, but not like Coda slow. So P1 in class and P11 overall, great result on Saturday. And then on Sunday, again, we were leading, leading the race. Uh, Towards the end, there's a code 35. There's multiple code 35s. It goes from code 35 to green. He nails the gas and all of a sudden there's a horrific noise and he's, he's calling on the radio saying the engine's gone and he pulls off to the side. I'm like, what the heck happened? Um, we pull the car in take a look at it and there's a hole in both sides of the block the rod just went through the block so anyways we t we take the car back we we fin ended up finishing p8 even though we had the engine failure um we take the car back and i've posted this online on facebook um just because i feel like uh there's no point in holding this kind of information um i i I'd rather share it and someone learn something from it but as it turns out uh we we took the rods took the pistons and we sent them back to mala the piston manufacturer uh, to have them inspect it and kind of figure out what went wrong. Well, it turns out we were reusing stock rods that otherwise looked fine and checked out. Uh, two of the rods were slightly bent and they were just bent just enough that the wrist pin and the big end were not on the same uh, plane. And so it was putting a little bit of side load on the wrist pin the entire time. Um, bear in mind, this engine probably had 50, 55 hours on it when this occurred. 
And it was at that point uh, on that Sunday race that the wrist pin got pushed out of the side of the piston, pushed the clip out, everything. And now it's only supported by uh, one section or one half of the, of the piston. And uh, it just went total failure. And if you go back and watch the video, you can kind of hear the noise change where it's, you know, it's sounding okay, then it sounds weird, and then it's complete failure. <laughs> And that was that wrist pin working its way out. And it turns out there was another one, uh, cylinder five, cylinder four, I can't remember which, uh, that was on the way out as well. And so lesson learned, we're not going to be reusing any OEM rods from here on out. Um, we built up a new engine after VIR, this time uh, Mala pistons again, but we used CP rods and did a few other little upgrades too, just for reliability. And so this is going into, um, Ozarks. About Ozarks, myself and the car owner flew out to Ozarks for a, a test, uh, a DE day uh, prior to this event to check it out because we had some concerns based on the track layout, uh, walls, lack of runoff, things of that nature. Uh, we drove it in an M2 CSR and I personally didn't care for it. Um, he didn't personally care for it. There were several incidents that week. GT3 Ferrari that stuffed it in a the wall. There were a couple Cayman GT4 cars that stuffed it in the walls. There were several others that decided it wasn't worth the effort. And we were back and forth on this. We were like, well, do we go and try to salvage some points or is it worth the risk to the car? And it looked like it was going to be a really low turnout anyways. And it kind of was. So we ended up skipping Ozarks, which was a shame. Um, I love to see new tracks being built, but I think there's a lot of things they could have done differently there to make that track uh, more suitable, especially for endurance racing. There's there's no there's no straightaways, so there's it's there's there's going to be a lack of passing opportunities for mixed class racing. Um, and we watched the the Porsche Sprint Cup race there, and it was single file almost the entire race. There was, it was I don't think there was a pass completed. Skip Ozark, and then we go to in, go into Sebring with our with our new engine that that we built. I personally and my engine guy built. Uh, we had a local shop do the machine work on it. Um, it was slightly bored over because the walls were a little out of spec. So 0.25 millimeter bored over. Uh, again, Mala pistons, CP rods. Um, and then we go into Sebring. Um, I guess I should back up and say that we actually did a test day at CNP prior to Sebring and the engine was smoking profusely after a few laps, oil smoke. We couldn't figure it out. We were thinking, okay, maybe the rings just didn't seat. Um, so we did every trick in the book to reseat the rings. And we also noticed the, the crankcase was getting a little bit more pressurized than it should. And so we were, we were really concerned, but at this point we don't have time uh, or an engine available to do another engine swap. We go to Sebring, kind of iffy on our engine. And then I think on Friday during, during qualifying, it's same thing. It starts smoking after a couple laps pretty badly, uh, oil smoke pull the car in. We do every trick in the book again to try to seat rings. Um, for those of you who are there, you probably came out of the driver's meeting thinking, what the heck's up? There's this guy doing donuts in the paddock, smoking up a storm. Yeah, that was me. I'm trying to seat the rings. So I was beating on it. We had the whole, the cylinders had been soaked in marble mystery oil and everything else we could think of. And so that was me trying to seat the rings, just trying to make the Saturday race. So I apologize if I scared anybody. So we go into the race. We're I'm pretty sure we're on we're on pole. We're still on pole. We put down a fast lap in qualifying, uh, but we go into the race and it starts doing the same thing after like one or two laps. It's smoking terribly. Uh, we're in the paddock, or excuse me, in the uh, pits. We're right next to Michael Moore Racing, who we're friends of, and they come over and they're right behind us on track. And they're like, the car is belching flames and smoke, and you need to get them off. And at the same time, I'm getting calls from race control. Hey, car 147. Uh, meatball flag, get them off the track. I call the driver and say, hey, bring it in. Brings it in, we check it over. It's it's done. There's no point in pushing it. We're just gonna keep doing the same thing. We bring the car in Saturday and I start making calls to see if I could find another engine somewhere near Sebring. And there's, there's nothing. There might be an engine in Miami. There might be an engine in Atlanta or something. I'm, at this point, I'm contemplating sending one of my guys back to my shop, which is a seven and a half, eight hour drive. I find someone who has an engine out near Tampa, supposedly a runner. So I send a couple guys out, to, out that way. They pick up the engine, come back, and I'm, I'm thinking, okay, we got a good halfway running engine. 
stock engine, whatever, it'll get us through the race. The engine shows up and all the exhaust valves are stuck down. And I'm like, this is not looking good. Uh, we end up pulling the head and discover every exhaust valve is bent. Every exhaust valve had contacted the pistons. It clearly had an over rev or some sort of failure in timing. And so at this point we have the engine in our car halfway pulled apart and we have this other engine halfway pulled apart. And we also discovered on the engine in our car that several of the cam lobes and rockers were just munched. Like they, like, like they weren't getting oil or something and they had just, um, you know, they turned funky colors and worn down and they, they were no good. So we took parts from, took the head and other parts from, uh, or not the head, but parts from the, uh, the bad engine that we picked up in Tampa and our head and kind of put them together and in hopes that we had something that would work. We're working late in the night. I'm sure some of y'all remember some of the photos and videos that got posted, but we're working late in the night, Frankenstein and an engine together. We get it back, we get it together late at night and it doesn't crank. It turns over, but it will not fire off. We check spark plugs, we got spark. We check fuel, we have fuel. We check compression, we have compression. There's no codes on the engine. Uh, it's just nothing's making sense. It'll turn over, but it, it won't fire off. And it would fire off a couple times, but it sputter down and die. So after all this effort, we have a non-running engine. I send the guys to bed, uh, cause everybody's beat by now. Show back up in the morning. I told the drivers, hey, it's a no-go, sorry. Show back up in the morning, try to start it again, still won't crank. Um, so basically the whole weekend at Sebring is a bust. And we decide to just load the car up. We push the car onto the trailer and head home. Here's where it gets really frustrating. As we're unloading the car here at the shop, I'm like, let's just see if it cranks. I'm in the car, I turn on the ignition, fires right up. I'm, you know, I don't know what to say at this point. It fires right up. I drive it into the shop, no smoke, no nothing. Still not running great, but it might've got us through a race on Sunday. So racing gods were not looking down on us that weekend at all. Anyway, so we, we get it back into the shop, we get the engine pulled, and this time I send it off to a, uh, a race engine builder. Like, hey, give us the post-mortem. What, what was wrong with this engine? Why was it doing this? And as it turns out, the machine shop, our local machine shop that did the machine work on that engine, they had just made the cylinder walls slightly too large, just ever so slightly. And, but the bigger issue really was the finished surface on the cylinder walls was way, way, way too smooth. And so we were not getting any oil retention, rings weren't sealing properly. The net effect of all that was we, we weren't getting good compression, even though my compression, get, compress, compression test set was saying we had good, decent compression. Essentially, we were overpressurizing the crankcase, uh, which was forcing oil into the intake, which was force, you know, causing us to burn oil and all kinds of other issues down the line. So as it turns out, it was a little snafu with the machine shop. Um, and it ruined a race weekend. We had another engine here at the shop that was uh, built by this engine, this race engine shop and had a dry sump system on it. And other than that, it was basically stock internals. It was built for endurance racing. We made the call to put that engine in the car, uh, convert it to dry sump, all this before Coda. So it was kind of a mad rush. I had to fabricate a tank, uh, not the tank itself, but the, the holding system for the tank. We had to have lines made. We had to do all this and that. Got the engine in, get a partial tune on it. We had a test day at CMP again. That's our, our local track, about an hour away. We get the engine in, break it in, break it in on the dyno, take it to CMP. It's running pretty good. Uh, we kind of have to recalibrate what our temperatures and stuff are. There goes the dog again. We get the new engine in and we, uh, we get, everything's looking good. We get the car turned around for Coda. I swear, dog. All right. So, so now we're at to the final race of the year and we're behind in the points. Uh, I think the 701 round three is leading the points and big mission 336 I think is P2 and then we're P3, but it's close enough that it's coming down to the final race to where if, if we win both days, we can pretty much lock it up. Uh, if we finish ahead of them, uh, but not P1, there's some math, it's complicated with the drops and everything else. But bottom line is we could still we could still win the the championship if if we finish well and maybe if we get a little help from our competitors and so we go into coda basically firing on all cylinders having everything done throwing all kinds of effort and work and parts and everything at this car to make it happen of course uh if you follow us on 
on social media, you'll know we had some issues with the trailer and truck getting out there, which that's a whole nother story. But we make it out to Coda kind of late. Uh, we get we roll into the paddock about midday on Friday. So we missed the first uh, half of qualifying, which fortunately for us, it had been kind of misting at Coda. So no one really put down a fast lap that morning. We get the car unloaded. Uh, we get Johan in the car and he puts down a freaking blazing lap. Um, really good lap. Um, but anyways, after our pole lap, which was right after lunch, we get called over to the dyno because supposedly people are complaining about our lap time. Uh, so we get called over to the dyno. We go on the dyno, and we've all seen the dyno at WRL. It's kind of sketchy, but we get dynoed, and our our peak power is exactly what we had on our dyno here in our shop on Monday. So I'm like, oh, we're good. Uh, you know, it's reading the same, and we dyno this car before every event. We tune it before every event because it's power to weight classing and and everything. And basically, your 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 compliance is the dyno and the scales. So we scale it, we dyno it, we scale it, we dyno it. We do we do that all the time. The dyno there at Coda read us, as far as Pete goes, right where we needed to be. And then we think we're good. We're back doing a brake job, I think, in the in the garages. And uh, the tech steward comes over and he's like, hey, uh, you've got too flat of a power curve. And I'm like, what? You know, I, you know, we we try to play by the rules and get it as close to that, that flat power curve without taking extra um, modifiers. I think we took a 0.2 modifier all season. And uh, he comes over and he's like, no, actually, you should be taking a 0.5. And I'm like, oh, man, point, you know, that's a 0.3 increase. That's, that's a pretty, pretty significant jump. We discuss it. We look at the dyno sheet. We go, I go back with the tech guy and we look at it. And essentially, there's no, there's no fighting it. It's their dyno that day is what counts, not my dyno. And I even provided them dyno sheets from, from Monday uh, at my shop, which is also a dyno jet. And he's like, yeah, by those, you're good, you know, perfectly fine. But again, that doesn't count. It's what's at the track that day. They do the math real quick. They produce another uh, uh, disclosure sheet for us and we have to add 76 pounds of ballast based on their scales and their dyno. So 76 pounds of ballast is not insignificant, especially on a car that's already ballast and really doesn't have a whole lot of room to add, add extra ballast. We're scrambling through the paddock. This is Friday again. We're scrambling through the paddock to find ballast. Um, I think it was TLM had some lead weights that they provided us at least to show that we can ballast it to that weight. We put them on the scales, it was good. Um, but I didn't. I wasn't really too into tying down lead bags in our car, it just didn't seem safe. So I sent a couple guys to the, the nearest uh, Academy Sports to go get some plate weights and to the nearest Lowe's or Home Depot to get some hardware. They come back, sun's already down, it's getting pretty late on Friday and uh, we start bolting weight down. And we had to bolt it down in some really odd places. I think we had one 25 pound weight on our front cross member uh, aluminum under panel. We had an extra 10 pound in the trunk and we had like 50 pounds bolted underneath the car onto some heavy duty subframe structure uh, that we had uh, to, to get it there. And then we reweighed it and it was good. And the whole idea was to keep it as low as possible and not throw off our corner balance if we could help it. Because of this, we start P19. Even though we had the fastest lap and everything, it, it, you know how it goes. We get DQ'd from qualifying. We start P19, um, but we have a chance to make up a lot of positions. We have Johan in the car. We know the car's quick. It's a little, it's heavier, but should be okay. But it was a pretty epic start. He goes from P19 to P4, I think, on lap one, making a lot of passes right off the bat. And then eventually we make it to P1 with, in less than three laps. And then it was the 701, and uh, eventually we got around them on about lap three, and we led the whole race. And unfortunately, uh, one of our drivers gets hit with a pass under yellow, and it was it was a pretty egregious one. Couldn't fight it. It, it was just a dumb move, and so that puts us down. Through fuel strategy, we and stretching our fuel as much as possible, we work our way back up to P1. But I'm doing the math. I'm doing the strategy on the on the pit wall, and I. I figure, okay, the only way we can win this is if we continue without a final fuel stop. And 701, the round three guys, we knew they at least had to do a splash of gas just based on their previous uh, uh, lap times or their previous stints. 
So it literally came down to the last lap. I'm telling the driver to fuel save as much as possible, lift and coast, lift and coast, draft behind another car, do whatever you can, because we're so marginal on fuel at this point. I know the lift pumps are just screaming. Um, and it literally comes down to the last lap about turn, well, really going into turn 12, the driver says, hey, I'm running out of gas, it's stumbling. And I'm like, coast it. I mean, I'm, I'm telling him, saw the wheel, you know, get some fuel over to the lift, do whatever you can. He, he manages to get it around to the carousel. He's, he's coasting at this point. Um, he gets passed by the 701 back there going into 18 or going into 19 and he's out. He, he comes to a stop at uh, just shy of turn 19. Last lap, checkered's already out. The upside here is we knew we had P2 locked. Uh, we had enough gap over P3 that we knew uh, regardless of finishing, just like at NOLA at the beginning of the season, that we had P2 locked down. So it was worth, it was worth the gamble. If, if we didn't have it locked down, we probably would have done a splash of gas um, just so we knew we, we could at least finish with P2. But considering we, we had that locked down, uh, we just decided to roll the dice, fuel save as much as possible, and, and hope we could stay ahead of the 701 guys. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't work out. They took the win, we took P2. Um, but I mean, what a, what a race. That was a pretty, pretty epic race there. And congrats to those guys. Um, they, they ran a really clean race that day. P2 Saturday, um, and our closest competitor, uh, finishes first. So we still have a chance at the championship, but it's, 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 we have to win. We have to win and we have to get some help from the 701, either finishing way down the list, you know, or some of our competitors getting ahead of them, whatever. It's looking like we can win this um, with a little help, the championship that is. Unfortunately, there's several uh, yellow flag conditions on track in kind of odd locations and we get hit with a pass under yellow. And then I'm like, oh crap, it's gonna be the same thing as Saturday. We're gonna have to go 11 tenths to, to make up this deficit. And then the 701 gets a pass under yellow. I think in the same exact spot. And I'm like, okay, it's all even, we're good. And then we get hit with another one, like a lap later, same driver, same everything. So we get two pass under yellows. Now it's an uphill battle. Um, unfortunately, they were kind of in locations where it's not absolutely clear that there's a yellow. I'm not, not giving excuses. It was just, they weren't egregious. I'll put it that way, put it that way. Um, but unfortunately it puts us down, so. Two lap penalties, and now we're, we're behind trying to play catch up. Um, so the driver is just beating on the car. Um, we do a couple uh, pit stops and changes, and I think we're about five hours in. I have to check the video, but uh, we're, we're past the halfway point. I'll put it that way. We've already done a tire change. We've already done several fuel stops. Um, we're past the halfway point, and then all of a sudden the driver calls in, hey, the left rear wheel is gone. And this is slightly after, not just after, but a little ways after a, a full service pit stop where we change tires. And I'm, I, I'm the wheel gun guy. And so I'm thinking, oh crap, did, did I screw up something? Did I not get all the wheels tight? And I'm like, man, it's just to get, to come that close. Anyways, um, car comes in on a rollback and we see actually what happened was the, the whole hub had sheared off. It, it wasn't a, pit stop issue or like loose lug nut or anything like that. And then we're instantly having um, deja vu from NOLA. Same exact corner, same driver in the car, same failure. So the hub, axle are both sheared, came off. It's nothing that can be repaired real quick. We started our season on a Sunday race and we finished our season on a Sunday race with a hub failure on the left rear. Two different tracks, but the same driver. Um, so at that point, we get a, I think we finished P6, what, which puts us P2 in the championship. 701 took the win, and, and congrats to those guys. Again, they ran a clean race. I think they that day they had a few uh, penalties as well, um, but we had more, and of course we had the mechanical failure. That's how we ended our season, like we started it, minus the win. So 
all in all, it's a great racing series. I really like that we're able to, you know, compete in a 20 year old car. We're able to develop it quite a bit and do things um, that otherwise we're not able to do like in a spec series, like with spec E46 or spec E30 or whatever. Um, so I really, I enjoy that from a, a shop owner's perspective and from a mechanically inclined perspective and from just a guy that likes to, to, to tweak on things. Um, we're, we're constantly finding speed. Um, and the other thing we really enjoyed is that our competition has really stepped it up. Um, when we first came into this series with the, the S50, S54 detuned package in this car, I mean, we were, I don't want to say we were dominating, but we were winning races by like four or five laps regularly. The next year, you know, it was tough. And then this year, obviously even tougher. So I've really enjoyed that. I really enjoy the series, the amount of track time we get um, at great tracks all over America. Um, so we're really looking forward to 2023. We're going to take what we what we learned this year and apply it and uh, hopefully come away with one of those championships. You know, we did win the West. We won the, the West uh, Midwest championship this year, uh, which was good. I'm not complaining about that. I think next year we're, our goal again is going to be for the overall. So hopefully we get it.